Hi, my name is David McGuffey. I'm a certified elder law attorney. Welcome to Medicaid 101. Now this program is not going to talk about all of the classes of Medicaid. We're going to focus during this program on long-term long -term care Medicaid. How do you get the bills paid? Uh, if you're looking at nursing home Medicaid or if you're looking at uh, home health care Medicaid in Georgia, usually that's going to be CCSP, uh, that's an acronym for the Community Care Services Program. If you are trying to get help with one of those classes of assistance, that's the focus of this program. So, Medicaid, is, you know, what is it? Well, the first thing I would tell you is it's confusing. It's part of the Social Security Act, and the Social Security Act is mammoth. It's gargantuan. It's huge and uh, it's jointly administered by the federal government and the state government, which makes it even more confusing because now we're not just dealing with one set of government bureaucrats, we're dealing with more than one set. We've got the federal bureaucrats up in Washington who are telling the state bureaucrats down here in Georgia what to do, and then uh, the Georgia bureaucrats are implementing the system, and I say that tongue-in-cheek because we've got a lot of uh, very good people in our state Medicaid program. But I do want to emphasize that it makes it confusing because we've got a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Medicaid is jointly funded by the federal government and the state government. And even though we have a federal overlay, the states are spending their money. So they get the privilege of customizing their Medicaid program. Now, that means that here in Georgia, our Medicaid program is different from... Uh, somebody you know in Tennessee or Alabama or any of the other states, our Medicaid program in Georgia is unique. And every state's going to be able to say that because every state contributes toward their Medicaid program. So, that means it's confusing. And you can see from this book, it's a humorous picture, at least I hope it's humorous, a picture of uh, someone trying to get to the bottom of something and they're pouring through this huge book. Uh, Medicaid's a lot like that because there are rules on top of rules and code sections on top of code sections. Now, the Medicaid program has been characterized as one of the most completely impenetrable texts within the human experience. That comes from a federal uh, circuit court of appeals and supposedly these are some really smart guys up there on the federal Circuit Court of Appeals, they get appointed by the president to serve on these courts, and they get life tenure under the U.S. Constitution, so these are supposed to be some pretty smart guys, and they're saying that it's an impenetrable text. And then we've got a different court, uh, which tells us that the federal and state Medicaid statutes have been described as the regulatory equivalent to uh, um, the Serbonian Bog, which is a reference in John Milton's Paradise Lost. It's uh, this fictitious uh, bog swamp where armies marched in and they were lost forever. So those of us from Georgia, those of us who are trying to figure out what the heck that means, here's what it means. It's like trying to go through the Oki Finoki swamp at night with no flashlight and no compass and no map. That's what the courts are telling you about Medicaid. So if you're trying to do this on your own, don't be surprised if it seems hard. The courts think it's hard. Most attorneys don't understand Medicaid because it's that complicated. You're probably going to want to talk to an elder law attorney if you need help qualifying for Medicaid. So, with that as a background, what is Medicaid? Medicaid pays for medical care. It does not pay you. It will never send you a check. The Medicaid program is, is not Social Security. It is not Supplemental uh, Security Income. It is not some other program that's going to help you pay the grocery bills. Medicaid pays health care providers for medical care. It is means tested. And I'm not trying to say the program is mean, although a lot of people will say it's mean. People that get denied say it's mean. What I mean what I am indicating when I tell you it's means tested is they're looking to see what financial means you have. Are you poor enough under Medicaid's rules to qualify? So eligibility is a three-part test. 
and all of these different parts have to work together. We have to look at uh, the different elements I'm about to go into and make sure that all of them line up, otherwise you will be denied Medicaid. That's another reason for seeing an elder law attorney if you're trying to become eligible for long-term care Medicaid. So, what is the first part? What's the first uh, part of this test, this three-part uh, test that we're looking at when we're trying to determine whether you're eligible? Well, the first part is you have to meet the categorical eligibility requirements. Part of that means you fit into what Medicaid calls a class of assistance. Not everybody who needs medical help gets Medicaid. There are a lot of people out there that need help and they don't get it because they do not fall within a Medicaid class of assistance. You must meet the basic criteria for that class of assistance. And uh, part of the criteria for nursing home Medicaid is that you have to meet the length of stay requirements. In other words, you have to need help for at least 30 days. If you only need five days of help, you don't meet the length of stay requirement. If you need help for a thousand days, you went well over it. But you have to meet the length of stay requirement. So not, only, not everybody who needs help gets it. Uh, one of the things that you may want to know, some classes of assistance are mandatory, others are optional. Now, one of the things that these optional categories uh, do is they change from time to time because the states, if the state doesn't have to give you Medicaid, that means they probably have the ability to customize the plan and uh, they have the, the ability to make it unique for them. So for most of the people that we're working with, that's going to apply primarily to the home health care program. The Medicaid home health program in Georgia is very different from the program in Tennessee. I'm well aware of that because I practice law in both states and this program is focused on Georgia. Uh, the programs in Georgia and Tennessee for home health Medicaid are very different. That will apply with virtually, or that, that will be something that you can observe with virtually all of the optional classes of assistance. And one of the reasons why I say that is uh, frequently people will hear from others that they know that you know, this is how Medicaid works. They're going to take advice from non-lawyers. They're going to take legal advice from the neighbor lady across the street. They're going to take legal advice from everybody except the lawyer, which I find uh, interesting. Uh, the fact that we went to law school and spend a lot of time learning how to help you sometimes means that we're the last person you ask a legal question of. But that... Uh, the fact that these programs can be different from state to state because of the federal state overlay and because the states can change their optional classes of assistance uh, means that more than likely the only person that's going to know the answers to your question uh, will be an elder law attorney who practices law in the state where you need Medicaid. So it's important to keep that in mind. Now. What other categorical eligibility requirements do you have to meet when you're trying to fit within a class of assistance? Well, you must be aged, blind, or disabled. You must make an application for Medicaid. They're not going to come out to your home and say, please take Medicaid. You have to go apply. Uh, if you hire an elder law attorney, most of them will do it for you, and then you won't have to worry about the application process. The Medicaid program requires you to prove that you're in the United States legally. You're either a citizen or you are a legally admitted alien, and they're also going to require some proof of identity. They don't just pass out Medicaid to people who want to go by John Smith. Unless your name is John Smith, and then you can get it. You have to meet what Medicaid calls the enumeration requirement. That's mainly uh, that you have a Social Security number. And then you have to meet the residency requirement. You have to be in the state where you're trying to get Medicaid. You can, you don't necessarily have to be a citizen of the state where you're trying to get Medicaid. If you are in Georgia, Georgia has an agreement with all of its surrounding states. 
So if you are a citizen of Florida and you moved to Georgia to go into a nursing home, but you maintained your citizenship in Florida, you can still get Medicaid in Georgia. You do have to be here, you have to be physically here though to get Medicaid uh, in Georgia. And then you have to assign third party resources. Medicaid is the payer of last resort. So if you are in a nursing home because somebody hurt you in a car wreck or some other uh, something happened and you are going to be getting some personal injury settlement of some kind, you have to assign those resources to Medicaid. If you are getting payments toward your medical care from some other resource, generally they have to be assigned to Medicaid if another person is legally responsible for your medical bills. Now, home health care assistance. Uh, you have to meet the categorical eligibility requirements for nursing home Medicaid placement. You also have to meet the uh, medical requirements. In Georgia, you basically have to meet the criteria for nursing home Medicaid placement, but you've chosen to stay home. That's important to know because many people don't, they wouldn't need nursing home care. They might need a little assistance and they're looking at assisted living or something of that sort, but they're not sick enough to need nursing home placement. Well, an individual like that's probably not going to qualify for Medicaid's home health care waiver. So if you qualify, what services can be provided? And we've got this list for you. Adult daycare, that's going to be available in many areas of the state. And in Dalton, we have a very good adult day services program offered through Ross Woods. In other parts of the state, if you're listening, there may be other adult day options. But the program, that program can be funded through the Home Health Waiver, the CCSP Waiver. Uh, alternative living services, uh, that's going to be a personal care home. Many individuals who are younger and have a mental health issue will uh, file for CCSP or some other class of assistance trying to get personal care homes paid for. Emergency response systems can be paid for. Home health services, actually having somebody come out to the house to help you with bathing, grooming, getting your meals cooked, things like that, that can be paid for. Personal support services and respite care. Respite care is very important for a caregiver. If you're trying to burn both candle or burn the candle at both ends and do health care 24/7 for your loved one, then you're going to find out very quickly that you uh, really need a break from time to time and respite care can be funded. Now, nursing home assistance, you have to be in a participating nursing home. There are a few, and I say a few because there aren't many nursing homes that only accept private money or Medicare, which is different from Medicaid. That's one thing I haven't really said yet. You need to understand that we're talking about Medicaid. Medicare is very different. Medicare is not going to pay for much uh, nursing home care. It's going to cap out at a maximum of 100 days and Medicare is uh, going to make no payments whatsoever towards your nursing home bill after 100 days. If you don't need skilled care, you may not even get your 100 days. And even if you get your 100 days, it gets worse. Even if you get your 100 days, only days 1 through 20 are covered at the full cost. There's a daily copay for days 21 through 100. So, you back to Medicaid. You must be in a nursing home that participates in the Medicaid program, not one that only takes Medicare or private money. You must meet the length of stay requirements, and you must meet all of the other eligibility requirements. Okay, now we're on part two. You have to be medically eligible. You cannot take a vacation to a nursing home and expect Medicaid to pay the bills. Medicaid's not going to cover your vacation to a nursing home. And I'm being a bit facetious. Most people don't want to go to a nursing home. Most people want to stay in their home so they can sit in their chair and pet their dog. And so most people are not going to go looking to go to a nursing home. But I want to point out that you can't just go there because you've decided you want to. You have to need it. It has to be medically necessary. Now, 
if you are trying to get CCSP, the Community Care Services Program, the medical necessity test will be, or evaluation, is going to be performed by a home health care agency. They are going to be sent to your home by the Area Agency on Aging. In Georgia, the gateway to CCSP is through the Area Agency on Aging, and so they will uh, be contacted either by your elder law attorney or by you, and they will send the home health agency out. And then once the home health agency certifies that it's medically necessary, then we go to the financial eligibility part, which we'll talk about later. And that's really where you're going to need the elder law attorney to help you if you're having problems. Now, if you're trying to get nursing home Medicaid, the nursing home will fill up the form and send it in to the appropriate authorities to prove that your medical uh, eligibility is uh, criteria has, has been met. So, we're on to part three. We're trying to figure out whether you're financially eligible for Medicaid, whether you meet that means-tested criteria that I talked about earlier in the program. We have to look at both income, monthly income, and your assets. Your assets will be everything except your monthly income. Monthly income is what you receive during the month. And everything else, your savings, your stocks, your bonds, your house, it's all going to be a resource. And trying to figure out how all this comes together sometimes is a little like trying to work out a formula or a flowchart or something because it can get quite confusing. Now on the income side, Georgia is an income cap state. That means that we have an arbitrary number out there and if you have too much income, then you're not eligible on the income side unless you use a qualified income trust. And we have a separate video you can watch on how the qualified income trusts work. This year in 2012, the income cap is $2,094. And how do I know it's $2,094? It's because it's always three times what the federal government pays people who are getting supplemental security income, sometimes referred to as SSI. This year they get $698 a month, or up to that amount. If they're getting some other income, then they get the difference between the other income and that amount to bring them up to 698 Medicaid takes that number and they multiply it by three and we come out with 2,094. And you ask, why that number? It's because they picked that number. There's no logic to this stuff. These are the rules. And you'll either follow the rules and get Medicaid or you won't and you'll be denied Medicaid. If you want help paying that six, seven, whatever thousand dollar a month nursing home bill you're facing, you have to follow the rules. And if you don't understand the rules, guess what? Medicaid doesn't care. They say you've got to follow the rules if you want their money to help pay the bills. So if you don't know what, uh, what the rules are, then you're probably going to want to hire an elder law attorney to help you satisfy the rules. Now, asset eligibility. What's that all about? Well, we look at your assets, and if you're single, you cannot have more than $2,000 per month if you're trying to get no, excuse me, you cannot have more than $2,000 in your uh, checking account, savings account, all of your countable assets uh, if you're trying to get Medicaid. And the, the reason why I tripped up and I said per month, uh, this is different from income, we're looking at your assets now, uh, but they look at them on a month-by-month -month basis. So if you allow your assets to accumulate, let's say you have your personal needs allowance and it uh, isn't spent. They, they let you keep a little bit of your income every month and you start letting that grow and accumulate. Then once it accumulates to the point where you have $2,001, you've got too much in your uh, savings account or your assets account and you will lose Medicaid. Or what happens if you uh, get an inheritance and suddenly your income goes over $2,000? Now you've got two thousand. You've got more than two thousand dollars in countable assets, and you lose Medicaid. So it's important that we keep an eye on all of your accounts, and uh, also if you are married, there is a resource allowance that your healthy spouse, your community spouse, the spouse who is not in the nursing home, gets in addition to the two thousand dollars. 
the community spouse is a defined term under uh, federal Medicaid law. The states have to follow federal law, so they also use the same terminology. The community spouse is defined simply as someone who is married to an individual in a nursing home. This community spouse can be in assisted living, they can be at home getting home health care, or they can be very healthy and going to the tennis club every day. There's just somebody who's married to a person in a nursing home and they get an additional resource allowance that I'll put on the board in a few more slides. So, which assets are countable? Um, generally, an asset's countable if you own it or if you have a legal right to control it. Uh, and if it's uh, not restricted in some manner so that you're legally barred from using it and it's not expressly exempt. So, what assets are exempt? There are a number of assets that are exempt, for, but some of them don't apply to everybody. For example, if you're listening to this video and you uh, do not uh, receive payments from Germany because you are a Holocaust victim, well, guess what? You're not getting an exempt asset. On the other hand, if, you, if your loved one is getting those payments, then you, those payments are exempt because we don't require you to put those Holocaust payments towards your nursing home bills before Medicaid will help you. What if you're an American Indian and we, you know, as an American nation, stole your land a hundred years ago? Where we might be, uh, you know, you might be living on a tribal reservation. Well, your rights in the tribal reservation are exempt and they don't have to be used. But for most people, those things don't apply. So for most people, it's going to be a, a short list. It's going to be the home and any contiguous acreage. It's going to be your personal items, your stuff, uh, and uh, what's in the house. One vehicle, most burial plans, but not all, because there's some technical rules George has imposed on burial plans, and assets that are truly unavailable, not because you did something to them, but because you just can't get to them. Uh, for example, let's say you've got a piece of land other than the home and contiguous property. Well, Medicaid would say that's a countable asset because it's not on the exempt list. It's like Santa Claus. He has his naughty, nice, his naughty list and his nice list, and we might call the nice assets as the exempt ones and the naughty assets as the ones you've got to do something with to get Medicaid. Well, your non-home place property is on the naughty list and you would have to do something with it to get Medicaid. But let's say you put it on the market and nobody buys it. Well, you can't pay nursing home bills with a piece of dirt. You can't go out and get a shovel and once a month bring a shovel full of dirt in and tell the nursing home, here's my dirt, because they don't take it that way. So it's not an available asset because you don't have a buyer. Now, you're probably going to need an elder law attorney to help you document that and help you get it right, but that would be an exempt asset. Now, a community spouse is allowed to keep $113,640 in countable assets over and above the exempt assets. And the reason why that allowance is out there is so the community spouse doesn't end up eating cat food. We want to give them uh, some resources in addition to monthly income so that they can pay the bills. And they're also allowed to keep all of their income, or if the community spouse has low income, they can have their six spouse's income diverted to them until they get up to a monthly income allowance of $2,841. Theoretically, these two allowances will allow the community spouse to retire. In reality, this is not a lot of money for two reasons. First, if you have a young community spouse and you have uh, $113,000 but say you're 70 and you've got a life expectancy of 20 more years. How far per year does $113,640 go? I'm going to stand here and tell you not very far. You're, you know, if we divide that by 20, that 1 20th portion that you might assign to this year will not put a new roof on your house. It will not go very far in replacing your uh, air conditioner if it goes out. 
it's not going to pay for your assisted living care. So I mean, that's one reason why people come to a little attorneys, is so we can help you plan in advance to try to gain eligibility and not eat cat food and not become impoverished. And even if you get income from your community spouse while they're sick, guess what? Sick people go to nursing homes and sick people die. And I'm not trying to make light of that, I'm just trying to make sure that you listeners know how the things really stack up. So if the community spouse is relying on that sick spouse's income to pay the bills and then that sick spouse dies, the income may go away. And then they're only getting their one little small check. So it's really important that we protect assets for the community spouse. Now, that might get some people thinking. And they're thinking, hmm, I wonder what I can do. And some people might come up with the brilliant idea of giving your assets away. Well, Medicaid's not stupid. I mean, we might make fun of them from time to time because they make all these rules for you, but they're not stupid. There are a lot of smart people in the Medicaid program, and they figured this one out. They figured out that if they didn't do something about gifts, then everybody would give away their stuff to get Medicaid because then they'd allegedly be poor enough. So what have they done? They've created these look-back periods where they have a, a time period when, when they can second-guess your actions and they can Monday morning quarterback your actions. And then if you've made a gift during the look-back period, they will calculate a penalty and for the period of time covered by that penalty, they will refuse to help you. So what is the look-back period? It's not a week goes by when people come in and they ask about the 36-month rule or the 60-month rule or the whatever rule. I've had people come in and ask about the 72-month rule. There is no 72-month rule. And the 36-month rule disappeared in 2006. The rules changed radically on February 8th, 2006. So the only rule we have in terms of how long can Medicaid second-guess your actions, it's a 60-month rule. So if you made a gift within 60 months of when you apply for Medicaid, Medicaid can evaluate that gift and calculate a penalty. Now what is the penalty? In general terms, Medicaid takes the value of the gift they divide it by what they say the average monthly cost of nursing home care is, and I'll tell you why that's important to understand in just a moment. And the resulting number is how many months they will refuse to help you pay the bills. So if Medicaid says that the average monthly cost of nursing home care is $5,000 a month, and you made a $100,000 gift, then it's a 20-month penalty. You can do that math. And if your actual cost of nursing home care is $6,000 a month, this is where I'm getting to on why it's important to realize that Medicaid's number, it's, it's important to know they make that number up. If your actual cost is $6,000 a month and you've been penalized for 20 months, can you do that math? That would be $120,000 in private pay payments. So if you're subject to that entire penalty, then your $100,000 gift actually cost you $120,000. It's one reason why it's very important that you speak with an elder law attorney before you engage in any kind of gifting strategy. Sometimes gifting is good, but an elder law attorney, a good one, is going to tell you you should only look at that after you've looked at everything else that you might be able to look at. Now. What about these exempt assets that I mentioned earlier? What about the home place? What about property that you tried to sell and couldn't sell? Is it free and clear forever? Is it protected? No. No, it's not. Because if you go on Medicaid and you die, Medicaid's been keeping up with what they put into your care. Medicaid's been running a tab. They, you should treat this as a loan program, not as a gift program. This is not your big Uncle Sam who's coming to your rescue, trying to protect you. Think of this more like the banker who's watching up on you, or even worse, the pawn shop guy or loan shark guy who's coming out to check up on you. And you might think of Guido, and 
you know, when you die, they want their money back. And where are they going to get their money? Well, they're not going to have a garage sale, probably, because they don't want to have a garage sale. That, that's too difficult. And they're probably not going to get any money out of it anyway. They're probably, they're not going to dig you up out of the ground and throw you out of your burial space, because that wouldn't make sense. The main asset they're going to go after for most people is their house because the house is the easiest asset to go after and it's the one that's the most valuable. So after you die, we have this program called estate recovery where Medicaid will file a claim in your estate and they will try to get their money back. And under the probate rules, creditors get paid before your heirs. Think about it this way. The bank gets paid before your kids if you've got a mortgage on your house. And so Medicaid comes into the probate case as a creditor. They get paid before your heirs do. And so having an asset treated as exempt does not mean it's protected. That's, you know, all of these rules are a little confusing. And, you know, we Medicaid attorneys are oftentimes juggling the balls trying to get you the best result we can get you. One of the things I can tell you, though, is that we can't do this for you if you don't call us. Now, if you've already got an elder law attorney working for you, then that's great, and I encourage you to stay with them. Uh, but if you don't have an elder law attorney and you're watching this video, and if you're interested in talking to us, you can call us at 706-428-0888. We've got offices in Dalton and in Atlanta. I told you at the beginning of this video, my name is David McGuffey. I'm a certified elder law attorney. We have offices in Dalton and Atlanta. Our address in Dalton is 105 North Pence Street, Dalton, Georgia 30720. Our website is McGuffey, M-C-G-U-F-F-E-Y, McGuffey.net. The Atlanta office is at 5855 Sandy Springs Circle, Atlanta, Georgia 30328. If you're calling from uh, outside of our area, then uh, you can reach us toll-free, 800-241-8755. Uh, if you want to speak with us about a case, feel free to call us. We do a free 30-minute consultation. If you decide to hire us, then you know, we'll talk about what your needs are and we'll quote you a fee. But that's not really the purpose of this video. The purpose of this video is to make you aware of the rules. And if you uh, want to refresh yourself, if you're trying to remember what did your attorney tell you about Medicaid, maybe this video will help you remember. Or if you're just trying to get your bearings and figure out whether you need Medicaid, maybe this video will help you. But whatever your situation is, I would urge you to remember that this is complicated stuff. Like I was telling you at the beginning of the program, even the courts say that it's complicated stuff. So if you're having trouble figuring it out, don't feel like the Lone Ranger. Don't feel like you're alone. And don't take advice from the neighbor lady across the street because I can almost guarantee you she'll lead you in the wrong direction.